those standards. Uh, thank you very much. And I think that concludes general questions. We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. And I call question number one, Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, many of us have been hearing from ordinary Scots this week who are deeply alarmed about the SNP plans to charge them for taking their own car to work. Yeah. Here's what one young man had to say in an email. I am a young apprentice from South Lanarkshire. I know two pounds a day doesn't seem like much, but this is often apprenticeship wage is a lot. While many in a similar age group are paying rent, council tax, road tax, and other utility bills, and some also trying to save for their futures. This is a tax that will hit the lowest and least represented of employment groups in the country. Yep. Let me make this promise to thousands of others like him across Scotland. Scottish Conservatives, all of us here, will oppose a workplace parking levy. Will the Deputy First Minister make him the same pledge? Deputy First Minister. Officer, I don't think it will come as a surprise to anybody that in a parliament where the government does not command an overall majority, we have got to talk to and reach agreement with other parties about, about specific issues. And of course, what we found in this budget process was the Conservative Party were spectacularly absent from those discussions. So they have no right to come here today and complain about the agreements that we have to arrive at. It's important, it's important that Parliament is clear about what is proposed here. This is an agreement to bring forward an amendment to the Transport Bill that will enable local authorities to exercise a judgment as to whether they wish to apply a workplace parking levy. The decision will be up to local authorities to take that decision. It is an example of localism in practice, and I would have thought the Conservatives would have welcomed that. Jackson Carlo. So almost unbelievably, the short answer is no. Mr Swinney will not be backing these people or thousands of others of workers like them. What an absolute disgrace. Presiding officer, at yesterday's finance committee, Derek Mackay even admitted he hadn't done any economic analysis of the cost of a workplace parking levy. But we have. A £400 annual charge would be equivalent to increasing the basic rate of a tax paid by a worker on the real living wage from 20 pence in the pound to 30 pence in the pound. So can the Deputy First Minister tell us when he promised when he promised not to increase the basic rate of income tax before the last election, did he imagine he'd be voting to thump those same workers with a new levy equivalent to a tax hike of 10 pence in the pound? Deputy First Minister. It's very important, Presiding Officer, that we remain focused on what is actually proposed here. And what is actually... And what is actually proposed here is the awarding to local authorities of a power to apply a workplace parking levy if they judge that to be the appropriate thing to do and once they have made the appropriate assessments of such a commitment. And I, and I, cited, I cited this as an example of localism quite deliberately because in 2017, Ruth Davidson said... Our manifesto for the council elections was published a couple of weeks back. It spells out a thorough and clear vision. At its heart is a case for localism. So the Conservatives have been full scale behind empowering local authorities. If that wasn't enough, Graham Simpson, the local government spokesman of the Tories, said, we believe that decisions should be taken as locally as possible and that power should lie with politicians elected as locally as possible. He went on. We need to empower councils and give them a renewed sense of meaning and purpose. Now, if that wasn't enough for Jackson Carlow, in 2016, the First Minister received a letter from four Conservatives urging her to re-empower councils to take decisions that they could think about themselves. The first author of the letter was Murdo Fraser. Oh. <laughs> the, second, 
second was Liz Smith. <laughs> the third was Morris Golden. <laughs> and Parliament will not be surprised. The final one of the quartet was Jackson Carlo. <laughs> Jackson Carlo, <laughs> presiding officer. <laughs> Order, please. Order, Order please. Officer. This isn't Blue Peter, and one pathetic excuse, one pathetic excuse that you made up earlier ain't going to wash it. Listen, for the last 12 years, I've marvelled at Mr Swinney and the full theatrical performance we get from him when the SNP are in real trouble. Out he comes, out he comes swinging, but the fact of the matter is, you know, the SNP uh, council leader and Edinburgh council this morning said, it would be a missed opportunity if employees did not have to pay the levy. Mr Swinney may support charging low-paid workers. Happily, some of his colleagues are made of sterner stuff. Just two months ago, speaking in Parliament, his colleague Richard Lyle made his opposition plain. He said, no, I am not for your parking charge levy, and I speak on behalf of thousands of motorists who've been taxed enough. said Mr Lyle, he's prepared to stand up for hard-pressed Scottish workers. Why isn't John Swinney? Deputy First Minister. As Jackson Carlow goes purple-faced, it's a bit rich to accuse me of theatrical performances. <laughs> <laughs> Presiding officer, the Conservatives have fought the 2016 and 2017 elections on a commitment to empower local authorities. The Scottish Government when the Conservatives would play absolutely no part in the process of setting a budget for this Parliament, cannot then come along and complain about the fact that this Government, yeah. in agreement with the Green Party, has been prepared to re-empower local authorities. That, Mr Carlaw, is rank hypocrisy even yeah. from you. But, Presiding Officer, what the Conservatives have to be reminded about is that if we had listened to them on the budget, if we hadn't reached an agreement with the Greens, we would have had to contemplate, if we'd followed the Conservatives, taking £500 million out of the budget of the Scottish Parliament, punishing families, punishing public services, reducing staff numbers. This government wouldn't count it as that, but that's what the Tories wanted to inflict on Scotland. Jackson Carlo. You know, Mr Swinney says we've no credibility demanding tax cuts and higher spending. He says the Tories have no credibility in the economy. It's a Tory Chancellor, Philip Hammond, who wrote the cheques you're spending, Mr Swinney. The additional... The additional... The additional 148 million Derek Mackay concealed from Parliament the week before he announced his budget. And when you've spent it to settle the mess you're making of teachers' pay, I hope you'll send them a thank you note for bailing you out of your own problem. <laughs> Presiding officer, it's sad to see Mr Swinney defend things in which he clearly does not believe. It's sad to see him defend a rise in the basic rate of income tax when he once said, and I quote, a tax rise would be a punishment for low-income workers. It's sad to see him defend an inflation busting rise in the council tax when he and the First Minister stood in a manifesto promise in 2016 not to do so. And it's sad to see him now demand that ordinary people be challenged, charged for driving to work when once as the champion of Middle Scotland, the gnat you could trust, he claimed to be the voice of enterprise. Isn't it time he admitted he got this wrong? Come on, man, simply drop this unwanted and unworkable plan. And if you don't, won't it be clear to everyone, despite trying to spin it today, that tens of thousands of Scottish workers are to be fleeced for hundreds of pounds a year just because Derek Mackay, John Swinney and Nicola Sturgeon can he say no to six dismal green MSPs? Deputy First Minister. Well, <laughs> if that wasn't an addition for the next pantomime in Glasgow, I've no idea what it was. After all, after all these weeks, 
of rehearsing while his boss is away, I would have thought Jackson Carlock could have come up with something <laughs> slightly more considered than that. I take it, I take it from that, I take it from that rant that Jackson Carlo is not in any way supportive of resolving the teacher's pay claim that I'm trying very hard to try to resolve. I take it from that Jackson Carlo wants to continue to inflict on the people of this country by applying the tax cuts that he wants to apply in the budget, a cut in public spending of £500 million, yeah. which would reduce the number of nurses in our hospitals yeah. by nearly 20,000. Is that what Jackson Carlo is seriously trying to argue for? Jackson Carlo has been found out today. He goes around the country. He goes around the country arguing for more powers for local government. Yeah. And when we deliver them, he comes here in an act of rank hypocrisy and criticises yeah. them. The people of Scotland can th see through the hypocrisy of the Tories. They can see what the Tories are about. Their spots have never changed. They want to cut public spending and they'll take the hypocritical way of doing it. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Deputy First Minister tell this chamber when the government last met its A&E waiting times target? Deputy First Minister. It, as Richard Leonard will know, the um, performance on A&E &E waiting times has been a significant challenge within the health service. But within those uh, waiting times, uh, the performance within the A&E units in Scotland uh, has been at the leading edge of the United Kingdom for uh, four years. So there are challenges to be wrestled with. That is what the Health Secretary is focused on making sure is the case. But for four years, A&E units in Scotland have delivered the best performance in the United Kingdom. Richard Leonard. Uh, well, that was a response, but not an answer to the question I asked. In fact, the government's waiting time target of 95% has not been met since last August. A principal reason for that lamentable record is its failure to tackle the delayed discharge of patients. And don't just take my word for it. Tim Davison, the chief executive of NHS Lothian, wrote this just last week. For a hospital the size of the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, the number of patients remaining in hospital when they do not need to be there is equivalent to three whole wards and is significantly impacting on our ability to manage the flow of patients through the hospital. It can impact on our ability to see and assess patients promptly. It delays access to a bed quickly within the agreed four hour target. It is contributing to short notice cancellation of planned elective surgery. Presiding officer, the previous health secretary promised to eradicate delayed discharge within a year. That was back in February 2015. So four years on, can the Deputy First Minister tell us when he believes his government will keep that promise and finally ensure that no one is left stuck in our hospitals when they don't need to be there? Deputy First Minister. I agree with the last point that Richard Leonard made, that it is important that people are only in hospital for the length of time that they should properly be in hospital. And the government is focused on trying to ensure that individuals have, uh, are able to make that journey through hospital and out into the community um, as efficiently and as smoothly as they possibly can do. Those are our objectives. In the process, we are reducing the extent of delayed discharges, the, the, the delayed discharges are reducing within Scottish hospitals. And one of the things that's helping that process is the increased investment that Mr Mackay made available in the budget process to invest in health and social care integration at community level within Scotland. So following the draft budget for 2019-20, we're increasing our package of direct investment in social care and integration to over £700 million. And that was central to the announcements that Mr Mackay made in the stage one debate last Thursday. So there is a, an intense focus within government and within the health service to make sure 
that we build up health and social care capacity within our communities. That is exactly what the budget is designed to do and it will assist us in reducing delayed discharges and making sure that individuals are able to make the smoothest journey possible through our health service, get the acute care when they require it, but the community care uh, when it is necessary uh, and appropriate for them to receive that. Richard Leonard. Well, uh, John Swinney talks about health and social care integration. Well, this week we also learned that in Edinburgh, the health and social care partnership is facing over £19 million of cost pressures. How does that help? Presiding officer, the scale of this problem is such that the number of people stuck in hospitals last year who did not need to be there would have filled the equivalent of every bed in Scotland's biggest hospital, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, every day for 326 days. No wonder that this is having a significant impact on A&E waiting times and cancelled operations right across the country. And there is a human cost as well. Tim Davison went on to say that delayed discharge means, and I quote, disruption and distress to patients and families, a burden on patients and their carers or families, and reduces the quality of their experience. Remember, these are the words of the chief executive of the second largest health board in Scotland. So my question to the Deputy First Minister is this. When will this government start to listen? When will he take his responsibilities seriously? When will he snap out of his complacency and start to address the continuing problem of delayed discharge in Scotland? Deputy First Minister. I think the, the manner in how I've responded to Richard Leonard's question, I think, demonstrates that the government takes this deadly seriously. What are we doing to tackle delayed discharge? We are increasing the resources available yeah. to social care integration yeah. within the community. We are seeing in Edinburgh, the, the health board that uh, Richard Leonard quoted there, in Edinburgh, we are seeing delayed discharges falling within the city of Edinburgh. We've put £160 million more into health and social care integration. Now, these are the judgments that the government is making within a very challenging financial environment. Why do we do that? Because we recognise, and this is where I completely accept the premise of uh, Richard Leonard's question and also the comments from Mr Davidson, that it is better for individuals to be supported within the home or within a community setting than it is to be in a hospital when they do not need to be in that hospital. It's entirely appropriate for them to be in hospitals at particular stages, but we must support individuals through that journey, which is why Mr Mackay's budget, which is currently going through Parliament just now, will see an increase in the resources available for health and social care integration to over £700 million. It's why we continue to support the increase in resources and why we are confident that the effect of that investment and the joint working that has been provided for in health and social care integration will deliver the reduction in delayed discharges which we all want to see taking its course. A number of constituency supplementaries. The first from Sandra White. Thank, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Uh, Deputy First Minister, you will be aware of the application to Glasgow City Council by the owners of the O2 ABC uh, building in my constituency for complete, and I emphasise complete, demolition of this iconic building. I have many concerns regarding this. Uh, one of the concerns is the closeness and vicinity to the School of Art and what that may affect that may have on the investigation. I've written to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Services in regarding that. But another concern is that the O2 building, whilst being iconic, was built in 1875, uh, older than the Macintosh School of Art, has not received the same publicity uh, or the same importance placed upon it. Uh, could I ask the First Minister or the Deputy First Minister if you agree with me that if, and I say if, the O2 cannot be saved in its entirety, we must do all we can can to ensure that the facade of the historic building is absolutely saved. Deputy First Minister. President Officer, I, I realise the significance of the point that Sandra White raises about the O2 venue within her constituency. Um, a building warrant application for the demolition of the venue was lodged with the City Council in Glasgow on the 31st of January. Um, obviously, each council must exercise their responsibilities um, in, individually, and in, in so doing, they must ensure that they comply with any legal requirement. Now, I, I'm not familiar with the 
uh, listing arrangements of the facade of the venue that, uh, that Sandra White has raised. But quite clearly, there will be a perspective from Historic Environment Scotland that will, that will need to be applied in those circumstances. And I will certainly make sure that Historic Environment Scotland uh, are actively engaged in the consideration of this matter as appropriately uh, with the City Council in Glasgow. And Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister how the Government will hold Aberdeen Roads accountable for the delays incurred in the opening of the final section of the AWPR when the Scottish Government has given contractors every opportunity to get a grip over this two, uh, 750 million project and get it fully open to traffic? Deputy First Minister. Uh, President Officer, uh, Aberdeen Roads Limited will only be paid when sections of the road are open to traffic. In this way, they are incentivised to open the road at the earliest opportunity that it is safe to do so. Um, Aberdeen Roads Limited still has work to do in providing fundamental assurances around the future maintenance of the River Don crossing that sufficiently protect the public purse. Once this commitment is received, there is no further barrier to opening the remainder of the road without delay. Over recent months, both Transport Scotland and uh, the Transport Secretary have worked tirelessly with Aberdeen Roads Limited, and I'm pleased to say that not only is more than 85% of the road open, but the feedback from members of the public in the northeast of Scotland has been overwhelmingly positive about this long overdue enhancement of the roads infrastructure of the northeast of Scotland. Stuart McWhelan. Thank you. The Deputy First Minister will be delighted with the outstanding news that the Texas Instruments plant in Greenock uh, has been purchased by Dios Incorporated in a deal worth a report of £65 million, saving 300 high-value and highly skilled jobs. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that this investment and news has been hard won, congratulates everyone involved for making this deal happen, and commends all the staff at the plant who have continued to deliver uh, despite the threat of redundancy hanging over their heads since 2016, and once again proves that Inverclyde is open for business? Deputy First I, 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 I do welcome the good news that has come from um, the former Texas Instruments plant and the acquisition by Deirdis. Um, it's an important uh, investment in the safeguarding of 300 jobs uh, at the plant. It's been a com accumulation of tremendous joint working between our enterprise agencies, the government, Inverclyde Council and of course the workforce who have given uh, extraordinary commitment to ensuring continuity and uh, we look forward to working with the company and taking forward the commitments that have been made uh, to the workforce that are involved. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's been another bad day on Scotland's railway, with power and signal failures causing disruption in Glasgow. But this is a sadly typical experience. Over the, the weekend, passengers took to social media to share their experience of delays, cancellation, overcrowding, showing pictures of people with disabilities going without a seat, children sitting on the floor outside the, the train toilet, a uh, passenger reported as having a panic attack. This isn't acceptable, it isn't safe, and it isn't what people in Scotland deserve from their railway. Can I ask what action the government took following last weekend's appalling performance by ScotRail, and how long it will be before we have a rail service run in the public interest that meets the needs of the public. Deputy First Minister. Well, first of all, the, uh, the, the, the Transport Secretary has made clear to Parliament already that the government considers the current performance of ScotRail to be not acceptable. And for that reason, um, the uh, Transport Scotland issued formal notification on the 24th of December uh, to ScotRail requiring them to su submit a remedial plan by the 18th of February. And the government will, of course, hold ScotRail to that. We expect them to set out in that plan how they will address these performance issues to ensure that we can realise the, uh, the benefits of the investment that's been made in new rolling stock and new infrastructure, which has been formidable in recent periods. Uh, Parliament is familiar with some of the uh, operational challenges that have existed about the late delay of new rolling stock, which has affected the ability of the service to operate as we would have expected, and also the training, um, and because of that, the implications there has been for the training of, of staff to operate the railway safely. Um, now, Mr Harvey raises the specific examples of the, the weekend. Um, ScotRail took a number of decisions to expand capacity on a number of routes because of the expectations about higher travelling numbers, particularly because of the rugby international match um, in Edinburgh. 
but quite clearly there were a, a range of other issues which were of concern in the performance uh, of ScotRail at the weekend. These are the very issues the government expects ScotRail to address. That is why the Transport Secretary is in active dialogue with ScotRail at all times to, 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 uh, to improve that performance and to require them to comply with the remedial order that the government has applied to ScotRail. Patrick Harvey. And I'm quite sure that Parliament will hold both ScotRail and the government to account when the, the plan for remediation of these persistent failures is presented to us all. But look, there, there's clearly a need for wider structural change. Many of us would agree, for example, that network rail needs to be in the, the control of Scotland so that we can have a truly joined up approach to these issues. But we cannot wait for that. That is no excuse for not taking action now. And three months ago, when many of these failures were already being regularly reported, the government voted against using the breakpoint in the ScotRail franchise next year. Look, if the government weren't convinced then, I think they should be convinced now that that option must remain on the table. Surely the Deputy First Minister won't rule that option out, because doing so would give Abellio a free pass to continue failing. Surely the government must work on the assumption that a public sector better may be needed from next year. Will the Deputy First Minister tell the Chamber what progress is being made on the urgently needed preparation for a public, public rail operator that will operate the railways in the public interest? Deputy First Minister. I think that there's, there's elements of Patrick Harvey's question which are more straightforward than others. Um, on the point about devolution of responsibilities that are in network rail, I'm in entire agreement with him. I think it makes eminent common sense for that to be the case because it would allow us to take forward the cooperation that exists within the ScotRail Alliance to a much deeper level of, of actual integration. And I think that there is, to me, there is a politics aside, a, a common sense approach to that to be taken forward. On the issue of the application of a break clause in 2020, um, if, the, if there was to be a situation which arose where there was to be, uh, if a, an operator of last resort was to replace ScotRail in 2020, that can only be a temporary measure. And under the current United Kingdom legislation, the requirement to tender the franchise would still remain, which then opens up the possibility, which we have now secured as a government, to bring forward a competitive public sector bid in that context. Now, development work is underway about how to uh, advance the concept of a competitive public sector bid. Uh, that work has been taken forward by the Transport Secretary in dialogue with David McBrain Limited, who we've invited to take forward some of that work. Um, I'm sure the Transport Secretary in due course, uh, if he's not been uh, already answering questions on this subject, will update Parliament on all of these questions. Uh, but the government believes, fundamentally, we have got to have an efficient public uh, rail network that meets the needs of individuals within Scotland, that acts in the, uh, in the public interest, uh, that delivers services that members of the public are looking for. That's what our immediate short-term action is focused on achieving, and it's why we're open to developing a competitive public sector bid within the context of the existing United Kingdom legislation within which we have to operate. We have some further supplementaries. The first one, Mike Rumbles. Will the Scottish Government's civil servants be giving badly needed assistance to John Finney in drafting his workplace parking levy amendment to the Transport Bill because it's obvious from his public comments earlier this week that he hasn't a clue as to how he wants it to actually operate? Deputy First Minister. Um, that's uh, obviously, uh, I, un I understand, I understand that Mr Finney has uh, asked and the Rural Economy Committee has agreed to take further evidence on this particular issue and obviously the government will contribute to that process um, and uh, as we look at the drafting of amendments of course the government will be actively engaged in that process because we agreed to that with the Green Party but I am a little bit surprised well am I a little bit surprised <laughs> uh, at uh, Mr. Uh, at Mr. Rumble's line of argument, because um, when the uh, provisions for a workplace parking levy were introduced by the Labour Party in the UK Transport Act in 2000, which gave enabling powers to English councils to introduce workplace uh, parking levies, 
those measures were supported, surprise, surprise, by Liberal Democrat oh, MPs. Oh, oh. So um, it's, um, it's just an, a, another example of seeing one thing in one place and another thing in another place. Yeah. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I wish to raise the case of the young son of a constituent. Uh, this wee lad's medical condition has been deemed appropriate for cannabis-based treatment and he has been offered epidiolex by his medical team. That was some four weeks ago, uh, but no treatment has yet commenced and no prospect given to the family of a start date. Meanwhile, the child's condition continues to deteriorate. Can the Deputy First Minister advise as to the clinical procedure once epidiolex is agreed as appropriate and investigate this delay? Deputy First Minister. It will, I'll, I'll ask the Health Secretary this afternoon to contact um, NHS Lanarkshire and establish all of the detail in this case. Um, if there is a way in which we can address the very real and legitimate issues that Linda Fabiani has raised in Parliament today, immediately we will do so. And I will ask the Health Secretary to update Linda Fabiani by the close of business this afternoon. Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 51 of Scotland's most precious places for wildlife are protected as Ramsar sites. Recent guidance from the Scottish Government appears to downgrade the protection given to many of these sites, including Cool Links in the Highlands and Loch Lomond in my region. This contradicts the Environment Secretary's very welcome commitment made to Parliament last year. So could the Deputy First Minister confirm if this recent guidance will be withdrawn and corrected, and that all Ramsar sites in Scotland will continue to be given the same level of protection as designated Natura sites, as is the case in the rest of the UK? First Minister. The, the uh, Ramsar sites are protected in Scotland by either the Natura um, uh, uh, regulations or by the uh, designation as sites of special scientific interest. Um, and, uh, I think it's very clear that that affords to these sites the highest level of environmental protection. But if there are specific issues that Mr Greer is concerned about in that respect, I will ask the Environment Secretary to correspond with him to address uh, any particular issues that are raised um, in relation to the uh, approach to designation. Because it is important and the government is absolutely committed to fulfilling the commitments and obligations that are incumbent on us in relation to the uh, commitments around Ramsar sites uh, and to ensure that those are fulfilled in all of the actions that we take. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Deputy First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on whether learning to play a musical instrument should be a core subject in schools. Deputy First Minister. Presiding Officer, music as one of the expressive arts is an essential part of the broad general education under Curriculum for Excellence. This includes class, uh, class music lessons, including when an instrument is taught on a whole class basis. An education authority may charge fees for the provision of instrumental tuition, which is discretionary over and above this. It is for local authorities to decide how to provide instrumental music tuition, depending on local circumstances, priorities and traditions. In taking these decisions, local authorities should consider the undoubted benefits that learning a musical instrument can have on well-being and on attainment. Christine Graham. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. That said, does he share my concern that Labour-led Midlothian Council is the only council in Scotland proposing to axe all music tuition for pupils below S4, at the same time paying out £10 million a year in interest payments from the education budget because of Labour's punitive PFI projects, with the result that if you want to play, you'll have to pay privately. Music for the few, not the many. And does the DFM agree with me that it's no wonder my constituents and I will be demonstrating against these cuts outside Midlothian Council HQ this Tuesday when one song we won't be singing certainly is to keep the red flag flying there? Deputy First Minister. <laughs> Presiding Officer, in my earlier answer, I stressed the importance that is attached to music as one of the expressive arts uh, within the broad general education. And I think it's an important part of the educational experience of young people that they are uh, able to participate in appropriate music tuition. Uh, the government has taken a, a number of decisions in this respect in relation to our own budgets. Um, the government, uh, under the uh, direction of my colleague Fiona Hislop, has reinforced funding for 
a number of key elements of the financial support we make available for music tuition uh, and appreciation within Scotland, um, with support for the music budgets that relate to the Youth Music Initiative, the National Orchestras uh, to Expo and Creative Scotland, all of which um, the uh, Culture Secretary Fiona Hislop has, uh, has maintained as budget commitments because of the importance we attach to music tuition within Scotland. Uh, there are some local authorities in the country who do not charge at all for music tuition. And I, am, and I am absolutely certain that after the budget process is completed in local authorities, there will still be many local authorities in Scotland that do not charge for music tuition whatsoever. And I would encourage Midlothian Council to reflect on that position. I also think that the Midlothian Council could reflect constructively on the conclusion of the Education Committee of this Parliament, which said that the committee respects the democratic right of local authorities to take decisions about local expenditure and acknowledge the financial choices they face. However, the committee believes in principle that music tuition should be provided free of charge in every local authority. And I would encourage Midlothian Council to reflect on that conclusion, which was agreed across the political spectrum in this Parliament. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister whether he agrees with another of the findings of the Education Committees? And I quote, there is a complete lack of clarity over whether instrumental music tuition undertaken for SQA exams can be legitimately subject to charging. And can he explain what the Scottish Government is going to do about this situation? Deputy First Minister. I, uh, I don't think there's any dubiety in the guidance that's available. I don't think there's any whatsoever. But the, committee, but the committee has raised a concern that there might be, in which circumstance I will look very carefully at it. There is one scheme, again in Midlothian, which troubles me greatly, where the local authority essentially puts the obligation onto the as a, it, it exercises an administrative charge on the school, but obviously for a school to be able to exercise free choice there, they have got to have sufficient budgetary control to exercise that. And I think that does stretch the spirit of the guidance, which I think is crystal clear on this question. But the committee has raised that issue, and I will explore it. But from, as I stand here today, I think there's no dubiety about that point. Alec Rowley. Right, officer, in the current financial year, 17.5 secondary schools are having to cut £2 million directly from their budgets. Parent councils have written to myself and to the deputy First Minister on that. The reality is that Fife and many other local authorities are clear that they will have to cut further for their education budgets next year. Is it not time that we had a degree of honesty around the cuts taking place to local councils and actually have to have a discussion on how we're going to solve those cuts rather than them blaming councils when we vote through those cuts? Deputy First Minister. Um, well, I, th I think uh, I know Alec Rowley is in quite a difficult position on this because his party didn't exactly engage on any aspect of the budget process and least of all some of the ideas that Alec Rowley himself put forward. But I think in Fife, um, Fife Council's spending power has increased in this budget settlement by over 5.8 per cent. So Fife Council has got to take certain decisions. But I come back to my, one of my answers to Christine Graham. Uh, local authorities today in Scotland, a number of them, do not exercise any charge or apply any charge for music tuition. So there are choices that are made at local level by individual local authorities. And when the spending power of Fife Council is increasing by 5.8%, I think it's up to Fife Council to look in that enhanced resource environment how they deploy the resources available to them. Question number five, Murder Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To uh, ask the Deputy First Minister, what categories of public sector workers will be exempt from the proposed workplace parking levy? Deputy First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, the government uh, has expressed support for uh, a willingness to develop an agreed amendment with the Green Party to the Transport Scotland Bill to create a discretionary power for local authorities to introduce such a levy. Uh, this is contingent on the exclusion of hospitals and NHS properties. Further discussion on the content of that amendment is underway uh, at the present moment, and there will, of course, be further dialogue with the committee and further dialogue with individual local authorities should they choose to take such an approach. Murder Fraser. Can I, I thank the Deputy First Minister for uh, that response. In exchanges earlier, he claimed this was a policy about localism. 
But the Scottish Government have already decreed from the centre that NHS workers will be exempt, quite rightly in my view, but not teachers, police officers, local government workers or other public or even private sector workers who might be lower paid. So can the, the, the Deputy First Minister tell us, how can teachers who are currently considering the pay offer from the Scottish Government take a proper view on that offer and what it means for their take-home pay when they do not presently know if they might be facing a £400 a year additional tax charge for parking at their places of work? Deputy First Minister. Well, uh, from somebody who voted against the budget and against the provision of any yeah. public funding to local authorities yeah. whatsoever, it is a bit rich, yeah. a bit rich, yeah. for Murdo Fraser to come here and make a claim about teachers' pay. Yeah. If Murdo Fraser has had his way, there'd be no money available on the 1st of April for our public services, and that is a dereliction of duty by the Conservative Party in this Parliament. We will take forward the agreements that we have reached with the Green Party. They will be subject to dialogue and consultation within this Parliament, and of course, if accepted, it will be up to individual councils to determine whether they wish to take forward such a provision. But for Murdo Fraser to come here with crocodile tears about teachers' pay when he's an advocate of localism demonstrates the hypocrisy of the Conservative Party. Andy Whiteman. Uh, the Deputy First Minister will know that powers to enable work par workplace parking levies exist in England. They were introduced by a Labour government and the Nottingham scheme was implemented by a Labour council. The Liberal Democrats supported such powers in the Transport Act in the Scottish Parliament in 2000. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that both these parties appear to be more interested in partisan political point scoring than in working together to tackle pollution, reduce congestion and empower local government? Deputy First Minister. Uh, I, I, I think... Members, members of the public will be, have, could be rightly horrified by, <laughs> by the way in which the Conservative, Liberal and Labour parties have abdicated yeah. their public responsibility to engage constructively on a budget process upon which public services depend. And Mr, Mr, Mr. Whiteman and I disagree on quite a number of different issues. But I respect Mr Whiteman for the fact that he understands that on the 1st of April, public services need to be funded. We need to collect taxes. We need to make sure the revenues are available to support our nurses, yeah. our hospitals, our schools, yeah. our public transport networks, our, our police services, the whole lot. And the Green Party were the only people prepared to engage constructively in that process. So my message to Mr Whiteman is he is right. The Labour Party, the Tories and the Liberal Democrats should be thoroughly ashamed of their appalling abdication of responsibility. Neil Bivy. If, if, uh, if the workplace parking levy is about encouraging people to use public transport, can the Deputy First Minister confirm why the SNP and the Greens uh, budget will cut support for bus services from £64.2 million to £57.2 million in the coming year, a cut of 10.9% and £7 million. Deputy First Minister. But the particular change that Mr Bibby refers to is about a loan scheme that was not used within the uh, bus service operators grant. Yeah. But bus service operators grant remains there as an essential part of the support for local bus services. And of course, the Transport Minister is currently taking through um, a bill um, in Parliament which is aimed to strengthen local bus services, and that's exactly what the government is committed to doing. Question number six, Mary Fee. To ask the Deputy First Minister, in light of it being Children's Mental Health Week, what action the Scottish Government is taking to increase the provision of mental health support for young people? Deputy First Minister. Uh, President Officer, the programme for government set out a package of measures to support positive mental health and prevent ill health, backed by a quarter of a billion pounds of additional investment. This includes over £60 million in additional school counselling services, supporting 350 counsellors, 
around £20 million for 250 additional school nurses and 80 additional counsellors in further and higher education. As part of Children's Mental Health Week, we have today announced that we will be producing new guidance on the healthy use of social media and screen time. The guidance will be designed in collaboration with young people and will seek to address some of the issues they face around social media and mental wellbeing. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for that response? In a report in December, the Mental Welfare Commission raised concerns about the lack of intensive psychiatric provision for young people, noting that work to explore the issues had stalled. Last year, the number of young people admitted to non-specialist wards rose to 90, and 14 young people were admitted to adult psychiatric care units. Does the Deputy First Minister think that this is acceptable? And what plans does the government have to increase the nationwide provision of specialist mental health beds for young people, including adolescent IPCUs? Deputy First Minister. I think Mary Fee raises a, a, an, an intensely serious issue, and I, uh, and I believe that we have got to make sure that young people receive the support when they have uh, mental health and wellbeing challenges at the earliest possible opportunity of the manifestation of those, of those uh, conditions. For that reason, I think we have to undertake the investment the government is currently making to strengthen what we might all agree are preventative interventions. Because if we do that, we will then minimise, and this is where I come to the specific point that Mary Fee raises with me, the need for acute psychiatric interventions. The earlier we can support young people, the, the, the greater will be our chance of reducing the necessity of young people to be admitted to um, inpatient psychiatric units. So we, ha we cannot see these in different compartments. We have to see them as part of the whole strategy, which is exactly what the Minister for Mental Health is focused on delivering. And uh, we will take into account the issues that are raised about acute psychiatric demand, but I would want to stress to Parliament the importance we attach to uh, handling these issues and resolving these issues within an overall preventative approach, which I think will be in the best interest of young people within Scotland. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Willie Coffey on congratulations to Kilmarnock FC on its 150th anniversary. We'll just take a few moments for, in fact, actually we'll have a short suspension while members change seats and the gallery also has a chance to uh, move and change. A short suspension. <laughs>